Hi, this is Matt, and you're listening to Bluegrass Jam Along, the podcast for anyone and everyone who loves bluegrass. So, my guest on Bluegrass Jam Along this week is Michael Jonathan, and there are many, many things I could talk to Michael about. He's a writer, he's a singer songwriter he presents a show he is a kind of kind of campaigner and activist for grassroots music across the us and around the world um and there's a couple of things i particularly want to chat to him about this week so first let's just welcome him to the podcast michael it's great to have you here matthew thank you so much to uh, for having me on and hello to all your many listeners i appreciate you uh you having me i have really, really looking forward to this um i sort of first came across you as I'm sure a lot of people did through the Woodsongs old time radio hour. And that is such a fascinating thing. Um, it's the, even just to look at the, the longevity, the amount of shows and the amount of guests you've had on is astonishing. And then when you dig into how the show is put together and kind of the way it all runs, it becomes even more astonishing on so many levels. Um, but would you mind just to start for anybody who hasn't, seen or heard wood songs just to give us a brief kind of summary of what it is because it's a it's an incredible thing sure it's a uh, multi-format fully syndicated worldwide uh, radio broadcast live audience in a theater that's filmed for television that airs on uh, pbs stations and other networks across uh, north america and around the world on tv it's on 536 radio stations it's on American Forces Radio Network worldwide in 177 countries on two channels, um, plus all the military bases in the world, which at this time of strife and tension, it's kind of nice to bring the uh, music of our collective front porches to people and uh, in, in audiences around the world. Um, it's built on love, and that sounds like a cliche, but Wood Songs is completely top to bottom, all volunteer run. Um, even the artists who come on the show, whether it's a uh, Bela Fleck or Brandy Carlisle or Chris Thiele or Michael Cleveland or whoever the artist is, Rhonda Vincent was just here. Uh, they come as volunteers as well. They're not paid anything. And uh, I believe that love is the greatest transaction of the arts. Everything happens and begins in the arts because of love. Every musician I know starts playing because they love it not because they're trying to make money. And and that love is what transcends everything that Wood Songs is about. And so that volunteer giving nature of the show translates to the audience and it has a very big audience. It has a very big listenership because of it. And I think one of the things I love about it, because it does have a huge listenership, but it remains kind of intimate as well. It feels like you're being invited into a like a just a big living room rather than it being a huge worldwide, but you feel like you're stepping into something that is, is pretty intimate and pretty kind of cozy and friendly. If that makes sense. It does. And I'm, I'm a, I appreciate you saying that we treat, uh, we treat wood songs as a front porch, as a front porch conversation. What you hear on the radio is exactly what happened on the theater stage. What you see on television is exactly what happened when we were filming it. I, I hate editing. So most shows will begin and end in exactly 59 minutes. And the, the, the volunteer crew loves that because all the, the editors and the, the audio engineers don't have to do a whole lot. <laughs> but it, it makes the show, what you hear is the is the breath and emotion of what exactly happened when we were filming it. And so that's part of, that's part of what my goal is to make the audience understand that they are a, a, they're, they're not an audience. They're a welcome part of what these artists are doing, what I am doing. You sort of feel that. Um, I think I, I, think I first discovered Wood Songs maybe, I don't know, 15 years ago. And yeah just sort of listening to it and then watching some of the videos, like you feel the audience there. Like, you know, sometimes you watch something and you know there's an audience, but they're just, they're an invisible thing. And you sort of feel the the room there as well. I think because of the format, you know, it's not just people come on and play music. You introduce things, you talk to people, you talk to the audience, you talk to the artists. And it's like, it's, it's like a fascinating combination of musical 
a sort of musical variety show and a chat show and a it's like a it's like a massive open mic night. I don't know if you have the concept of an open mic night in the States and the way we do it in the UK, but it's just a night where they have a mic, you get up and anybody wants to get up can sing and it feels like the audience and the performers are part of the same deal, if that makes sense. It does. Um, Wood Songs is a performance and conversation format. It's what makes it different from many other wonderful broadcasts that are out there. You know, Mountain Stage is an example that, you know, we're much different from Mountain Stage, which is a, a brilliant broadcast, but that's a concert oriented show. Mm-hmm. Wood Songs is different. It, we want the audience. It's hard to love something if you don't know about it. And we want the audience to know who is this artist? Who is Rhonda Vincent? What was her background? Why does she do what she does? What is her passion? What is her motivation? Where does her energy come from? What is the new album about? How hard was it for her to record this? You know, and and to do all that with a second artist in 59 minutes can be kind of (laughs) hard. But I think the audience connects to the storylines as well as the music. Yeah, I mean, that's sort of where this podcast comes from, really. It's just the idea that if you're interested in I mean, for some people, music is music and they can listen to it and they don't care about the context. And that's perfectly valid. And you can enjoy music without knowing what the context is. But I want to know who the people are and I want to know where they came from and what their story is and where this all sits. And I think that's just one of the one of the lovely things. I was I was doing a bit of reading about the the history of Wood Songs. And I love the idea that at the beginning there was, you know, a few people in a room and it was recorded on a cassette that had to be flipped over halfway through. And like now there's this sort of multi-camera, you know, professional. And it's, I love things that build, like they don't just arrive fully formed. They start and they, they work their way up to being what they are. And that, that story and that, um, there's something about a long build of something that is built to last and is, you know, it's a, the fact that it was all volunteer run while that was building, you know, that, that, that in itself to me is a, the, the, the Wood Songs crew is probably the main story of Wood Songs, what they do, how hard they work, the passion in their heart, the fact that they're always there. They're not paid a penny. They're always there when there's a show and they do a great job. Uh, this past Monday, we, uh, we filmed and, and recorded show 1,106 all our live audience. And you're right. When we started, we were in a tiny little recording studio. We barely sat 12 people. We would bribe them with homemade cookies and apple cider um, to show up. And, um, you know, and the audience did. And the audience continues to show up. And, you know, when we, we do a broadcast and there's hundreds of people in the room, we're still amazed. We're still grateful. We're still excited by their presence. And it means the world to the audience because I'll tell you, Matthew, the, the arts are a holy trinity. It's a great song delivered by a great audience in front of a great. It's a great song delivered by a great artist in front of a great audience. Sorry, um, that is the trinity of music. That is the holy triad that makes our world work. You take one of those elements away. You have nothing. And that's sort of what has happened to the music business as a whole. They've taken elements of that away. If you look at Music Row in Nashville, it's a ghost town musically of what it used to be. It became very corporate, very money oriented. They removed the love part, you know, and the audience stopped responding. You know, uh, nobody ever dreamed five years ago in North America anyway, the biggest retailer of CDs was going to be Cracker Barrel, a restaurant, was going to be the biggest retailer of CDs in North America. Really? There's not a single record store chain left in our country. I know Europe is is much better off than the uh, than the artists in America. So I, I applaud you guys for that. But in America, anyway, the artists are struggling. It's very, very hard for them to make a living out here. We'll be right back with you just after this. Bluegrass Jamalong is proud to be sponsored by Collings Guitars and Mandolins. If you're attending the NAMM show in January, stop by the Collings booth to say hello to the team, get hands-on with their selection of customised acoustics and electrics, and check out some exciting new prototypes they're working on for 2024. They'll also have a few of their world-class artists on hand demoing various instruments. And if you can't attend, 
Don't forget to follow their Instagram and Facebook accounts throughout the show for photos, videos, and the latest news. Collins guitars are hand built from the sound up in Austin, Texas. <laughs> This episode is also brought to you by Peghead Nation, the home of Roots Music Instruction. If one of your 2024 resolutions is to improve as a musician, Peghead Nation is the place to go. They have 65 streaming video courses for guitar, mandolin, banjo, fiddle, dobro, bass and ukulele from some of the leading names in acoustic music. Courses cover bluegrass, old time, Irish music and swing, plus lessons dedicated to improvisation, theory and ear training. Your first course is just $20 a month and you can add more for $10. Try any course free for a month with the promo code JAMALONG. Make 2024 a year of more music at pegheadnation.com. Yeah, and I think that's true for creative people around the world in so many ways. There are, you know, whether it's novelists or actors or musicians or whoever, there are a small amount of people making a lot of money there's a small amount of people making some money and an awful lot of people making not very much money at all. And, um, you mm-hmm. know, and that's, I guess I was, I was going to talk about this when we come on to song farmers, but just the part of the, you know, when I read um, a bit about song farmers, one of the things that struck me was this idea of essentially reevaluating what success means because, it's that it's the perennial thing of like if you if somebody tells you they're a writer the first question is always like have you been published if somebody says they're an actor you say what have i seen you on we don't just accept that people are these things because that's what they do there's this initial like what you know i'm a musician or where where have i heard you what's your record called or whatever and it's if you play music or act or write or whatever then you are a musician or a writer or an actor and that is success but we've the commercial element you talk about has sort of reframed the way we think about artistic success, hasn't it? It does. And, and you're right. When I was, you know, wood songs being, uh, you know, it's successful, but it's all volunteer run. Nobody gets paid. Why do artists do that? It's because they want to introduce themselves to the biggest audience possible. Why? Because when an audience, when the audience loves you, when they love Matthew, the audience is going to do what the audience has always done. They're going to buy your stuff. Nobody in the history of music paid $1,000 a ticket to see Bruce Springsteen because of marketing. They did it because they loved Bruce Springsteen that much, that he was worth that much to them. Marketing didn't do that. Love did that. His hard work for years and years and years and pouring himself out to audiences. That's why they love him enough to pay that to see him. And and when you look at the... um, the world of music that most musicians are in, Matthew, you're hundred percent correct. You know, you're an artist, you're a musician too. You know, it's very, very hard for them to make a living. Most musicians do not make a living with their music. They don't, they have a side gig, nothing wrong with that honor. It's one of the most honorable things that they can do, but what are we doing? We're, we're vibrating air for three and a half minutes. That's in- is not worthy of adulation or huge checks you have to do something with that music now you know nobody's going to send a a tape to a record label and try to get signed because a labels only sign 360 deals now b you have to have an investment package behind you to do that and most artists don't have that and c and there's hardly any record labels left anyway to sign you and if you do get signed, Matthew, what are they going to do with your album? They're not going to put it in stores. There are no stores. Mm. So what, what's the good of giving half of you away to a record label that can't really do much with it? And so that's where the idea of Song Farmers came in. And kind of reintroducing. Go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say just is this it's sort of that the theme that runs through wood songs and song farmers seems to be this idea of a front porch and a a sort of communal sharing of something um, that is about, like, I guess it's about connection and communication as much as it's about anything else. The idea of song farmers is, is artists who want to reinvent their view of their own music to do something real, to do something practical, to do something work that works. And to do that, 
they have to get rid of the idea of making a living with it. And that's hard. You know, you can hold on to the old business model if you want, but the old business model no longer exists. It's like stockholders trying to keep the rotary phone around because they invested Mm. in it. Well, the world is wireless. What good is your rotary phone? I mean, honestly, you're wasting your time. And so uh, Wood Songs, Wood Songs Kids, Song Farmers, all these projects are to help artists completely reinvent themselves as artists. How do you use your music in an artistic way that really, really works? And you know who the greatest example of that was? Pete Seeger. Pete Seeger couldn't get signed. He couldn't release anything. He couldn't get on TV. Radio was not playing his stuff. And so what he did was decided to clean up the Hudson River, and he built himself a big boat called the Clearwater. He wasn't paid to do it. He got no money for it. It was a genuine, loving thing for him to do. He cared about his hometown. He cared about his earth. He cared about his environment. And here he is now in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame the Congressional Lifetime Achievement Award winner, and he's just sailed up and down the Hudson River in New York doing hometown concerts along the Hudson River trying to get people to see how dirty the water was, believing that once they did, they'd clean it up. He did that because he loved something, and the audience responded, and it turned out to be one of the most powerful things Pete Seeger ever did. And so what I'm doing is sort of a musical Clearwater. That's all. You know, there's nearly 100 song farmer chapters around the world. Most of them are in North America. And all it is is once a month or so, the chapter leader, Matthew or whoever, a a songwriter, a musician, gathers their friends together in a big circle. They all sing the same songs together together. In this big circle, they invite others to come sit and watch and listen or sing along. And it's a way to bring your community together. In this political climate worldwide, the most powerful peacekeeping source on this planet are musicians. Why? Because they get people to stop what they're doing and listen. And it's physically impossible to fight during the act of listening. It's the most powerful peacekeeping force in the world. And musicians aren't using it. They're chasing a buck instead of hearts. And and I'm saying going after hearts is what Pete Seeger did. And it was hugely successful for him. Little tiny Teleco Plains, Tennessee is a tiny peanut of a town. And they started a song farmer chapter there. And they had upwards of over 200 folks coming every month. To the song farmer gathering. Uh, 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 Cabot, Arkansas, the same thing, a tiny little peanut of a town. And it got so big that the local banks got concerned and they started hiring food trucks to come and take care of these huge audiences that showed up to come to these song farmer gatherings. Uh, Cork, Ireland, Pat Kelleher, a wonderful banjo player and musician. He's doing a song farmer chapter in, in Cork, Ireland. It's very, very successful. And there's scores and scores of them where musicians are learning that their music has a higher calling and a higher value than just trying to make a living with it in a system where you can't make a living with it anyway. So why fight it? Yeah. And that's, that's a really interesting point. I, you know, I, this, I've been doing this podcast for three years now and I, I've, and if I'm honest, I've spent a lot of time thinking how could I get it to make some money so I could spend some more time on it and do some less of less of the others. And probably the best thing for this podcast is it is not what makes my living for me because I just do it goes where I want it to go. I interview the people I want it to interview, and I do the things that I want to do with it, and that feels great. Um, I still get frustrated, and I still wish I could you know spend more time doing it. But actually, I think if I'd had six months of funding and time to launch a podcast, I'd have spent five months of it meticulously planning a thing that after six months, nobody would have wanted because it was overthought and overworked and second guessed. And, you know, the fact that I've had to just get on with it, I think has been a positive thing. 
Um, but it's hard because, you know, we do all think, well, this I'd, I'd love to make my living out of doing this. And it's, you know, those, the days of making your living out of making content are not what they used to be. Well, it's hard. You know, you can get a half page story in a hometown newspaper these days. It used to be a big deal. Today, you get a half page story in a newspaper. Nobody reads it. They're not reading newspapers. It, it's it's hard to get the, the audience attention. I tell everybody uh, facetiously, tongue in cheek, there's a reason folk rhymes with broke. Mm. And we have to accept that. When you accept that and you do things like you're doing, Matthew, when you reach out to the audience, they will do what the audience has always done. If they love you, they're going to buy your stuff. And I'm going to give you an example of this new business model that we're in. Facebook is worldwide. Anybody in the world can use their thing for free. Why? Because it generates a huge audience. And now Facebook is worth billions of dollars. Google worldwide. Anybody can use it for free. It's worth billions of dollars. Why? Because it has a huge audience. YouTube, Twitter, X, whatever you want to call it. You know, it's the same thing. They give it away for free. Why? Because when you generate a big audience, the audience will do what the audience always does in, in the music and in the arts. They're going to buy your stuff. They want to be part of the artists that they love. It's a natural human impulse that always works. That's the greatest business model of the arts. Love the audience enough to reach out to them. They will re reward the artists that they love. So what you're doing, Matthew, is exactly what Facebook and Google and every other artist that's out there right now trying to uh, find their audience. It's the right thing to do. You're doing it for free, but the audience can tell you're there out of your heart. And that's why they're responding to, to you and your podcast, to wood songs, to song farmers, to everything else. Yeah, and it's really interesting, isn't it? That that sense of it, – it's also then the, the sense of success or self-worth or whatever it is that you get or purpose or satisfaction from doing a thing um, is very real because you know that the thing you've done is the thing you wanted to do and intended to do and – that's incredibly satisfying. There's there's been times as a musician or, or whatever else that you think, well, what can I do that other people will like? And it's really, you know, by the, if you go down that route, you end up creating something that maybe other people don't like and then neither do you. And then you're stuck with this thing that, <laughs> that nobody wants. Or, you know, you see artists that end up with music that is loved around the world and they hate trotting out the same songs every night because it's not, you know, they did it to please an audience. And, and this, there's something incredibly grounding about all of this. And I think it sort of ties back into that longevity we were talking about as well. And just flicking back through some clips and seeing things like Sierra Hull at age 10 playing with Sam Bush. And then 20 years later, Sierra Hull playing with Wyatt Ellis, you know, and watching people graduate through all of that and but remain within it. It's not like a... There's not this sense that wood songs is a thing you do when you're starting out and then you graduate from it. So many of the artists have come back again and again and have, you know, stopped by throughout their careers. And there are some of the biggest names in American music coming through that theatre and, and that stage. And Well, you mentioned a, a young Wyatt Ellis who, who plays, he's 14 years old, he plays the Billy Strings and and, uh, and and all these amazing artists out there, Sam Bush and others. He's on the show this coming Monday. Who's he, Who's the other artist on with Wyatt Ellis? John McEwen, founding member of Nitty Gritty Dirt Band. You know, it's a it's a it's a heartfelt celebration of this front this figurative front porch that I view is worldwide. It's a global front porch, and I want Wood Songs to represent that. The kids part of Wood Songs became so successful is the highest rated portion of the show. We have a youngster on every single show. Sierra Hull was one of the first Wood Songs kids we ever had. Uh, Wyatt Ellis has been a, a Wood Songs kid a few times. You know, we've had several, Parker Hastings and so many others. You know, Ben Solis started out as a Wood Songs kid. And that segment has become so successful that I was like, well, how hard can it be to start a second radio and television broadcast? Well, it's pretty hard. 
but we we have launched the Wood Songs Kids series as well. It's sort of a Mr. Rogers meets the Grand Ole Opry, mm. and we're beginning our third season of that. And it's, it's airing from New Zealand to Florida and Ireland and, you know, public television around, around the world. Several TV, streaming TV networks have picked it up already. And this is a celebration of just kids. It's like a mini Wood Songs, but it's only kids. And, and Matthew, they are amazing 10 year old banjo players that can challenge Bela Fleck with what they're doing. You know, little little tiny kids that can play toe to toe with Tommy Emmanuel. You saw the clip with little Sierra Hull. She was ten years old on stage with Sam Bush, and she didn't sacrifice a single note to him. You know, she was she was wall to wall with Sam Bush. Didn't give it up at all, and now she's you know Grammy Award winner touring with Bela Fleck. You know, so but they were there out of love. We were there out of love. And that love has translated into careers for many of these artists and kids. Yeah, and it's I saw that um Baylor Fleck tour here in London a couple of months ago with Sierra playing and Brian Sutton and he like there's the highest level of music making you could possibly witness, but the joy and the the sort of the smiles on their faces while they were playing and the you know, this is just something they're gonna do anyway. And they happen to be in a position to do this stuff for audiences, but you can you can sort of see that 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 whether we were there or not, that was a joyous experience for them to get to just play that music together. And it's it's impossible to be cynical about things like that. That's true, and you know all of those artists have all been on Wood Songs for free. You know they they are not shy about how much heart they have inside their own musical sensibilities that the audience is that important to them that you don't always have to get paid in order to be in front of your audience because that audience is what is making your career and when the audience knows that you're sacrificing on their behalf it's amazing what the audience will do in return for an artist when the when the audience sees these song farmer leaders around the uh, the world that are bringing their communities together in song and music and love and happiness and joy and neighbors and families and celebrating their hometowns th- these song farmer chapter leaders become mentors they become heroes in their hometowns they become musical heroes in their community because they have they're doing something none of these other musicians are doing they're all in their basements banging away on their guitar waiting to be discovered well these folks are out there bringing their folks together they're doing something with their music they're able to introduce their songs that they're writing but now there's an audience for it you know it's a it's and it's how Bela Fleck built his career it's how Sierra Cole has, has built her career it's how Wyatt Ellis is building his they're out there meeting their audience the money part is not the concern bringing their heart in front of an audience is what causes the reward. And unless artists are willing to do that and get past the old business model that I have to have a ticket for everything. I'm not giving anything away. You know, I mean, what are CDs today? They're not financial transactions. They're business cards. Everybody's given. So, I mean, I'm, that's what I tell everybody. Let's get real. Let's get honest about what's actually happening. And let's reform the way we think about the world of music and art. And do you think listen, my sort of perception coming into this from outside, um, outside of the bluegrass and sort of American roots community, is that this is an element of this is baked into the music, and in that it's started as social music. It's kind of exists in communities. The divide between the audience and the performers seems to be much more blurred than in a lot of musical genres. And is it is that sort of a slightly rose tinted view of it, or do you feel like that's just part of the music to start with? It's part of the legacy and the history. Bill Monroe put the essence of bluegrass and folk music together when he said this form of view music has made more friends around the world than any other form of music in history. It was friends, it was heart, it was neighbors. When you go to a bluegrass festival or a folk festival, The best music there is not happening on the main stage. 
It's happening in the campgrounds and the parking lots. It's all those picking sessions and jam sessions. That's that's where you're going to find uh, Billy Strings picking with with 13 year old Wyatt Ellis in the in the in the hallways and the parking lots and and you know Del McCurry and Ronnie McCurry are out there and, and you know picking with folks in the tent ground. You know Brian Sutton does the same thing. Bela Fleck, all, you'll always find Bela Fleck in the parking lot at a festival. He doesn't want to sit around waiting to go on stage. He wants to play. And, and that is the communal nature of the only fastest growing music on the planet, bluegrass and folk music. It's because, because there is a blurred barrier, barrier. I like the way you phrase that, Matthew. It's a very blurred barrier between the main stage and the parking lot pickers. They're friends. They're all on a first-name basis. J.D. Crow knew the name of just about every fan of his. He'd come off his bus, and there'd be a big old line, and he would talk to them. One of the most interesting things that ever happened to me, uh, I, I grew up in New York. My neighbor was Pete Seeger, and he invited me to come to something called the Strawberry Festival. Would you come and play? You know, I was like 19 years old. And we were there, he and I were talking, and everybody started surrounding him because, you know, he's Pete Seeger. And so there's a big crowd around him. And a little kid from New Pulse, New York, showed up with a poster. And the poster was about him performing at a coffee house. And it had his name in big letters on the on this poster and where he was playing and stuff. And he wanted to show it to Pete Seeger because Pete was his hero. And Pete saw that put his hand on the on the kid's shoulder, he was like 15 years old, excused himself from this circle of 30 people wanting his autograph and to talk to him. And I followed Pete. We went to a tree nearby, and he, Pete sat down at the base of the tree with this kid and explained to him why putting his name in big letters when nobody knew who he was was not a good idea, that it was best humble. And he said, always remember that making friends is better than making fans. He says, your poster is trying to make fans. He says, I encourage you to make friends instead because they're going to stick with you longer. And man, when I saw that, I was like, holy cow. John Hartford was another example. Can I give you one real quick? John Hartford, one of the best banjo players probably in the history of bluegrass music i was doing a bunch of shows with him and i was like amazed before every concert john hartford would stand in the lobby and welcome the audience into the theater and i said john most everybody else meets the audience at the merch table afterwards why are you out in the lobby before the concert and he said because if i say thank you to them before I get a standing ovation, they're going to know I meant it. Mm. And I was like, that just totally affected me. I was like, this is the love part of music. This is the part that I want in career. I want that love part. And, and these are all great examples of, of very successful musicians that put the heart before the chart. They put the people before the wallet and it worked for them and it can work for you, for anybody. And you, I'm talking about your audience. You know, it can work for everybody that, that puts the emotion of what music is supposed to be first. The money comes later. Yeah. That's a beautiful story. I love that. The idea of the heart before the chart. Um, and it's really interesting. You talking about Pete Seeger just now, because sort of looking back through, a couple of interviews with you and I hadn't realized that Pete Seeger was a neighbor of yours um, when you lived in upstate New York. And it sounds like you hadn't realized that either. Well, we knew. <laughs> yeah. Isn't that funny how that happens? We knew he was a, a very nice guy. Um, he claimed to be a musician, but he played the banjo. So to a bunch of rock and roll head teenagers in New York, like that's not a real instrument unless you can plug it in. And he used to show up at our at our grammar school uh, after thunderstorms with an axe 
because he would heat his little cabin that he built on the side of the mountain with wood, and he was always collecting firewood when he was home. But even when I was a kid, some old guy showing up on your schoolyard with an axe, even though he had permission to do it, he was still a little disconcerting. Hmm. And when hmm. I when I did uh, high school, a friend of mine called me up and asked if I wanted to uh, work with them at a at a radio station on the Mexican border in Laredo, Texas. And I was there for a couple of months, and I I played a song. It was time for an oldies song. And uh, I played Roger McGuinn and the Birds. To everything, turn, turn, turn. And I noticed that it was written by my neighbor. And I called him up, and I said, Pete, it's it's Michael from next door. I just realized that you're, you're Pete Seeger. And there's this long pause, and he goes, well, I have been all my life, was exactly what he said. And I said, <laughs> Well, I, you know, I want to be a folk singer. What do I do? I had this musical evangelical moment. And he told me, he said, don't go to school. Don't get a manager. Don't try to get a record deal. Go into the Appalachian Mountains because that's where that music was born. If you mean it, go to where it was born. And I did. I, I went to a little, I ended up in a little hamlet in the Appalachian Mountains in Kentucky called Mousy. Kentucky, M O U S I E, Mousy, Kentucky. It's uh, two mountains away from Mini, Kentucky. Which uh, mm-hmm. these these are the children, the children of the of the coal baron that owned the twenty five thousand acres of Knott County, Kentucky, and uh, they were all born before Walt Disney. So I lived in Little Mousy, Kentucky. Went up and down the hollers with my guitar and banjo, knocking on doors, and the folks there were so sweet. And they were so nice. And I had hundreds of front porch hoot nannies. I think that's what created the front porch imagery with me. Because we would always sit on their front porch. They pull out their mandolin or their fiddle or just sing a song. I learned like 34 renditions of Shady Grove. And, you know, they were just so excited to meet what they considered an outsider who was not there to change anything. I just wanted to learn the music because I'm genuinely interested in it. And that, you know, Pete Seeger is the one who sent me out on that journey, which I'm grateful for. And at some point, I, I think you've had Roger McGuinn on Wood Songs, haven't you? Five times. And imagine just, you know, if somebody told you back then that that would have, that's that, that would have led to that. It's... You know, yeah, Roger McGuinn was a huge hero of mine. And you know what they say, you know, uh, the worst thing you can do is meet your heroes because you'll always be disappointed. Roger McGuinn is the sweetest, kindest, open, generous, he loves people, loves his music. He loves he loves the world of folk music, not just rock and roll. He is, he's dedicated to preserving these songs and mentoring and teaching others. He was, he was and is a huge joy. And his wife, Camilla, is just, just precious. So, you know, uh, whenever he would visit, you know, after Wood Songs, uh, my wife, Melissa, and I, and Roger and Camilla, we'd always go out to dinner. He was always willing to come on Wood Songs, even if he didn't have something new. If I'd call him up and say, Roger, would you like to come back? And it was always, well, let me look at my schedule. We'll call you back. And he always did. <laughs> but it, it was like he he understood the idea of what Wood Songs was supposed to be. And I'll tell you something. When when it's favored nations, when that when an artist knows nobody's getting paid they're fine with it it ha- it's not because it's not paid up it's not the opposite of pay to play it's we're all doing something shoulder to shoulder together it's it's honest the crew is working for free the audio engineers work for free the tv operators work for free the theater is donated your local hotel rooms are donated for free it goes Free to public radio, free to public television, free to RFD, free to American Forces Radio Network. You know, it's it's fair. And so Judy Collins and Brandy Carlisle and Del McCurry and Chris Thiele and Bela Fleck and the Fleck Tones or Bela Fleck and whoever comes on the show, you know, and Tommy Emmanuel, greatest guitar player in the world, has been on 12 times. You know, it's when it's fair, 
it's fun. And when it's fun, everybody wants to be part of it. My job is to shut up enough during the show to let the artists tell their story. <laughs> yeah, and it's one of the bits I do love about it. It's funny, you mentioned Tommy Emmanuel, and there's that there's a clip of Tommy doing Blue Moon, this famous kind of, you know, being the whole band in one go. It's just one of the I think probably one of the most loved clips on YouTube of, of anything amongst acoustic musicians. And and it's an astonishing thing, but for every, you know, but for that, there's so many just other moments, you know, you could sort of run your list, run your finger down a list of any of the shows that are on the archive and pick something out, somebody you'd never heard of. And just, it's a bit like sometimes a, a format works so well. So there's, there's a radio show in the UK called Des Island Discs where they get a celebrity or not a celebrity, just somebody who's done something interesting on and they choose their favourite songs and talk about their life. And because it's so, like, just a, such a genuine thing, it doesn't really matter if you've heard of the person who's on it or not. And it's the same with Wood songs. You might get Del McCory one week and you might get somebody the next week you've never even heard of. And it's it feels like an equally strong billing because you come to it knowing you're going to learn something and you're going to hear something that, it's worth hearing. I, I agree with you. You know, I say it I say it at the beginning of every broadcast. You don't have to be famous. You just have to be good. That's what, you know, at Wood Songs, I, I don't care about your commercial success. We don't care if you're on a label or selling your CDs out of the trunk of your car. We don't care who your manager is or what famous band recorded their album on the same mixing board that you've recorded yours on which I see that in press releases a lot. I don't know why, <laughs> you know, it's, 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 are you trying to be, is Matthew trying to be Matthew is, you know, is, is this artist trying to be themselves or are they trying to be Bob Dylan? Well, there's already a Bob Dylan. We don't need another one. We need you, you know, and the audience doesn't respond well to copycats. They respond well to artists on the limb passionate enough to take a chance and it, it doesn't matter it, you, what bin you're in doesn't matter what you call it it doesn't matter what bin you're in because there's no more bins they're gone so with wood songs it's folk and blues and bluegrass country celtic old-timey new singer songwriters we've had opera singers we've had poets just reading poetry you know it's it's the celebration of the art of music what you call it is irrelevant. What matters is how much you love what you're doing. And do you love it enough to come on a show like Wood Songs and demonstrate it to this big audience and let them decide if they love you back? And that's, to me, that's the and point. Presumably that's what's... Sorry, I was just going to say, presumably, that's what's kept you there since 1998. I mean, I, you know, one of the interviews that I read with you before this was from 10 years ago. And um, the interview was asking you what you thought you were doing in 10 years. And I think your answer was something along the lines of, you know, Wood Songs will have reached 2000 shows and I wish the new host well. <laughs> and the new host is still you, right? <laughs> <laughs> Well, here we are 10 years later, and I'm on this fascinating pod podcast. So, you know, things are working out really well, and I'm very happy. We've launched a second series of Wood Songs Kids. The Wood Songs audience gave birth to the Song Farmers community, which is going worldwide with, with scores and scores of chapters. You know, uh, what it's done for me personally, you know, uh, uh, the audience is responding to me as an artist as well. So I'm able to make a living mm. and support my family. I have nine-year-old twins I've got to take care of. You know, I don't have a side gig. I, music is what I do. You know, I've got my, my 21st album is coming out this year. Uh, I'm, I'm writing my seventh book that's going to get published later this year. You know, uh, I've got two mo movie scripts that are, you know, hoping to get produced into into production soon. If your audience wants to see something amazing, go to caneycreekmovie.com. Starts with a C. Caneycreekmovie.com. And this is part of the whole idea of someone passionately giving themselves to a cause that helps 
thousands of people to no credit to themselves. It's a, one of the most amazing women's stories to come out of Appalachia. It's, a tr- it's sort of the uh, dances of Appalachia. Well, we'll definitely put a link to that in the show notes so people can go and have a look at that. Um, yeah. and so I wanted to point out as well that coming up in um, May is the 8th annual Song Farmers Gathering, isn't it, where all the chapters get together? Yeah, hundreds and hundreds of song farmers from around the world will assemble for a weekend. It's a front porch picking party. It's it's workshops. It's great food. It's uh, it's mini concerts. It's so, nonstop song circles, nonstop bluegrass jams, and it's a way for the song farmer community to come together, share ideas. It's mostly chapter leaders. I mean, any any song farmer member can come to it. They come for free. You become a song farmer member, you get two free tickets to come to both days of the song farmer gathering. Uh, you know, we're not trying to reach into your wallet. We're trying to motivate your heart to do good things in your community. You know, and, and it's, it's, a, it's an amazing thing. You know, the artists come from Canada and Australia and California and Florida and Vermont uh, this year from Ireland, you know, to come to this weekend gathering where the the main focus is not money. Here's a problem that I see. Can I be really bluntly honest for a moment? Yeah. There's all these wonderfully good-intentioned music conferences that dedicate themselves to folk music or bluegrass or blues or Americana. And the problem that I see, it costs an artist more to attend the conference than they make all year long with their music. The the idea of it is wrong. The intention might be good, but the execution of it is wrong. Why should it cost more to attend a music conference supposedly to help you market your music than the average artist makes all year long playing? It's wrong. It's just not right. So that's why we give uh, Song Farmer members uh, free tickets to come to the gathering. We want them to come. We're not. We're not trying to to go corporate. You know, these other conferences they they tend to be very corporate in nature. And and I say corporate what? There is no corporate. There's no record labels left. Venues have been shutting down. You know, artists can't make a living because of streaming. Nobody's selling CDs because the audience doesn't buy CDs anymore. So what are you doing? What, what's, what are you really doing here? How are you helping? And so I, wanted, I want song farmers to, to remain genuine and fair and true to the, to the artists that participate. And there's an interesting kind of full circle thing there that, you know, that this sort of roots music started on front porches it was social music it was played in communities by people who knew each other for other people to listen to or dance to or and the advent of radio and recording meant that that could then go around the world um and then that sort of introduced a need for it to be entertaining and it became a product and it became a whole and there's you know there's a whole other conversation there but there's something lovely about the idea of wood songs and song farmers and trying to take the idea of that front porch and connect all those front porches around the world and, you know, bring something that has become incredibly global and which there's many, many good things about that. But just to kind of try and knit it back together to feel like a community, even if some of the people are halfway across the world from each other, to try and remind us that, like music is essentially a community endeavor at heart. There's a old 200 year old Slavic saying that went, when translated, if everybody in the whole world simply took care of their own homes, you wouldn't have to worry about the world anymore. In the 1960s, that became a bumper sticker that went think globally, act locally. That's wood songs and that's song farmers. We're, we're trying to get the global community to, to go full circle, go back to the front porch, 
that's the truth of where things are right now. So let's be honest with each other. Let's be motivated. Let's do something with that truth that actually changes things, that actually moves people, that actually brings community together. It's like we said in the beginning of the podcast, this is the greatest, most powerful peacekeeping movement in the world. And you don't think this world needs it right now? This world needs musicians and artists more than ever, but it needs those that understand what's really happening so that they can use their music and use their art in ways that actually cause benefit and change to their hometowns and their communities. And that's what I see happening more and more, whether it's wood songs or song farmers or just folks being willing to get together and bring their hometowns together in music and song. Uh, I'll give you one last that I think you know, your audience might appreciate this. You know, he loved drawing and art. He loved it. He didn't do it for the money. He did it because he loved it. Over a thousand drawings and paintings in his tiny little 10 year long career. Couldn't sell anything. Nobody liked him. Nobody wanted to have his his stuff hanging on their wall. No gallery owner wanted to carry his stuff, but he continued on because he loved it. And he did this one painting that was a, 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 a an artistic prayer to a God he wasn't sure he believed in. He fabricated what he saw on this canvas. It was a it was him pleading for the idea of home, the idea of a God, the idea of reaching out for something to believe in. And he offered it to his friend as a gift, and his friend didn't want it. And he offered it to two others as gifts. Nobody wanted this painting. And he died with nobody liking this painting at all. And today that painting is insured for over $1 billion. And that was Vincent Van Gogh's Starry Night. Nobody wanted it. He couldn't give that thing away. But the reason he's Vincent Van Gogh is because he loved it enough to not stop. He wasn't focused on the money. He was focused on his art and trying to get people to understand why he was doing it. And today he's the most revered, famous, recognizable, duplicated, copied artist in the history of art. Because he didn't quit. Because he didn't take the love part away and focus on trying to sell things. He kept painting what he loved. And that was the end of it. And that's, to me, that's, I'm not comparing what we do to Van Gogh, but it's the same spirit. It's the same passion. It's the same reason we're doing it. And and hopefully, you know, we can continue that. And 10 years from now, I wish the new host well. (laughs) (laughs) Well, in 10 years, I'll have you back on and talk to you while you're still the host. <laughs> I would love that. Hopefully, I'll still be doing this in 10 years. Yeah, right. I, we'll, we'll both celebrate. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if this has, if this has, you know, a fraction of the longevity the Wood Songs has had, I'll be delighted. Um, it's been such a treat talking to you. I've really enjoyed it. Matthew, thank you very much for having me. You're, you're doing a good thing, and you're doing a, 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 a truly wonderful effort to – to bring your audience together. And I I certainly applaud you. And thank you very much for letting me be part of it. Oh, thank you. It's been a treat having you on. Bluegrass Jamalong is proud to be sponsored by Collings Guitars and Mandolins, making some of the finest guitars and mandolins in the world since the 1970s. Visit collingsguitars.com and find out why.